And that's where I think the foundational research really needs to be done, right? What does CBD do? What does CBDA do? What does CBC do? And that's where yeah, no, nobody's going to really fund that stuff outside of industry. It really would be nice to see the, you know, the USDA and some of the agricultural communities kind of get to get together and say, listen, this is getting used a lot out there in our dogs and cats. It's not the species that we're that interested in, but we should be setting aside some funding for those kinds of interesting studies so that we understand the safety. Um, we understand uh, the potential you know, pharmacology of it. Good morning, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the Pet Food Science Podcast, where our goal is to share research findings to help support the continual innovation in the pet food and nutrition industry. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Shovler, and I'm here today with Dr. Joe Wachschlag. Joe Wachschlag is a professor at, uh, at Cornell University and in the College of the Veterinary Medicine and in the Department of Clinical Sciences. Dr. Wachschlag is both a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, Nutrition in particular, and the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Re- Rehabilitation. I have many, many common interests with uh, Dr. Wachschlag, but today we are going to talk to you about cannabinoids in particular. And Joe, I hope one day that you will come back and you'll talk about working dogs because we are both really excited and passionate about working dogs. How about we start, um, I gave a little bit of an introduction, but wouldn't you um, uh, describe what you do at Cornell University in terms of research, teaching, and service, and the services that Cornell provides? Yeah, well, you know, we have a long history together here, uh, uh, Kate, so we, we met way back, i say 2006, and our journeys have actually been somewhat similar. You're in uh you were in industry, and I had just started out in academia, and, and you, you came over to the the light side, let's let's say, and into academia. Um, but you know that that journey was really sort of spawned by the fact that veterinary schools are were becoming more interested in, in in nutrition training for their students, and so we we started a program here at Cornell where we started a clinical service, and that clinical service uh, still holds to this day, eighteen years later, where. We're basically helping optimize diets, particularly with dogs and cats who have you know, real medical conditions. And as we know, there are a lot of therapeutic diets that people out there are ordering. Um, very often, you get a dog with kidney failure as well as uh, needing a low-fat diet or something. And, and a lot of the therapeutic foods that are available just don't really hit the mark. And so we do a lot of home-prepared diet preparation. And and I think that's becoming a, an interesting trend where people are wanting to feed um, you know, home-cooked diets. Um, and our service has grown about threefold in that respect uh, in the past uh, 15 years, just because I think folks, um, you know, they trust what comes from the table more so than what comes uh, in a package. So, um, so we've, we've kind of built that service up here and do a lot of consulting uh, in, inside this college and outside the college. And then, of course, you know, a lot of uh, folks say that vets don't learn a lot about nutrition. Well, at Cornell, they're there's plenty of dog and cat nutrition. We do equine nutrition. We teach some ruminant nutrition, a lot of the basics. But then again, uh, we also you know, look at uh, some of the nuances of feeding diseased animals. And so we try to train the students to appropriately for all of that. Fantastic. And in terms of your research, Joe? Yeah, the, you know, research has, has been a, a ballywick of many things. I, I was a cell biologist uh, by trade in my PhD. And did a, little, a lot of cell biology work. So my initial foray into to research was around uh, cancer cell biology, where we published a lot of stuff on nutraceutical use. And this is probably where the cannabinoids kind of fit in too. So we looked at a lot of the, the we'll say, nutraceutical use and whether they could actually hinder or, or uh, promote uh, cancer cell growth, things of that nature. Um, and of course, yours and my passion is working dogs. And so that's always been something that I, I have dealt with in Prior to actually becoming a faculty member, I had my own team of sled dogs, and we were doing uh, a lot of research here at Cornell back in the late 90s and, and sled dogs. And then I kind of kept that up and was always very interested in sled dogs and their unique ability to run 1,000 miles in 10 days. Um, 
and then uh, be none the worse to wear for it. So, you know, looking at that metabolism, looking at their electrolyte balance, and it's a great, we'll just say, extreme model for, for exercise, we'll say, um, you know, exercise metabolism, exercise tolerance, and, and recovery. So. Tired of one-size-fits-all solutions that don't quite fit? At Wilbur Ellis, we're bringing custom back to the customer. We know that for your pet food and treats to shine on the shelf, you need to start with the best. After all, even the best recipe is only as good as its ingredients. From nutrition to preservation to blending and bottling, make one call to Wilbur Ellis Nutrition to find it all. We don't sell to you, we work with you. A true partnership to meet your needs. Follow Wilbur Ellis Nutrition on LinkedIn to learn how partnering with a purpose could double the power of your team. Yeah, dogs, dog, dogs are uh, really, really neat. And hopefully you and I can have a, a conversation where we can really showcase uh, what high performance dogs can lend to the pet food industry because they're a pretty sensitive model when you think about how much they consume and how hard they work and the kind of stress we put them under. It's, it's so neat. Um, now, Regardless of that, maybe a nice segue, uh, you did talk about nutraceuticals and disease treatment. So today we were going to talk about cannabinoids. So I thought maybe a really good grounding spot is if you would describe to the listeners um, what the kind of family of cannabinoids that are available to them uh, to add either um, into pet products, pet food products, pet treats, um, or as a uh, therapeutic. Yeah, this becomes a bit of a cannabinoid 101 lecture then. Um where, where the, you know, the reality is, is everybody thinks of cannabinoids as uh, you know, THC, which is the major cannabinoid that people use recreationally and actually can be used medicinally for things like uh, muscle spasms, pains, uh, particularly, you know, there's products that are FDA approved here in the U.S. and that are actually a mixture of cannabinoids to help with, with pain. And so, uh, you know, to that you know, end, we have to actually understand the hemp plant or the cannabis sativa plant. And so, you know, there's a there's probably differences in in your um, your home country there, which is Canada, where of course marijuana, which is basically cannabis sativa that's got high THC, is is legal, and so um, everybody's growing and there's dispensaries all over the place. Down here in the U.S., certain states can can have dispensaries because it's it's legal in I think 11 or 12 states right now, from a recreational point of view. But that's just one of the cannabinoids, and the THC is, of course, you know, the, the most popular one. But the plant itself actually starts out by making a, a cannabinoid called cannabigerolic acid. And that cannabigerolic acid is the sort of the mother of all the cannabinoids. And then the cannabigerolic acid in the plant can get synthesized into THCA or CBDA or CBCA, just to name probably the three most abundant ones that are actually in uh, cannabis sativa. If you're in the U.S., your marijuana, if you have more than 0.3% dry weight of THCA or any of the THCs, and then if you're uh, below 0.3% here in the U.S., you're considered hemp, and hemp is actually legal federally. So you can grow as much hemp as you want, you can do whatever you want with it. It can actually be distributed within each state, and a lot of states now have hemp growing programs. And this is where I'm talking about these A's, right? THCA, CBDA, CBCA. Those are all the acids that are made by the plant, but the minute you heat it and extract it, it turns into straight CBD, which is a neutral compound, or THC, and that's the stuff that course, when you smoke it, you get THC. You don't get THCA, but if you were to actually eat a hemp plant, you would get THCA, which is actually non-psychotropic. So it has to be THC to be psychotropic. So this is where, you know, everybody's got their quote-unquote perfect blend, right? And you'll see on the market that uh, this one, you know, a lot of dispensaries say this one actually is good for partying. This one's good for sleeping. This one's good for X, Y, and Z. And that's probably due not only to the slight mixture of cannabinoids, but also the other plethora of compounds that are found called terpenes and flavonoids. And so they all sort of have this mild interplay. And this is where some of the literature is suggesting strain to strain, there can be some differences. Now, of course, all of them will get you high if you're having you know, cannabinoids that are high in THC, but you can get slightly different feelings based on 
the we'll say admixture of the 400 different chemicals that are found in, in, in cannabis. And so this is uh, known as entourage effect. And so one strain can make you feel a little bit different. Now we're talking about what's in the pet world. We're not talking about THC, of course. We're talking about uh, CBD, cannabidiol. And that seems to be the most popular cannabinoid. And it's the one that's being, uh, you can get a lot of it out of hemp. And so that's the cannabinoid of, we'll say, choice to put into, um, you know, pet supplements or pet products. So everybody is sort of on the, the CBD kick now in terms of what we can, we'll say, legally put in. We can put CBD into a supplement and give that to our dog or cat because in the U.S. there are no supplement laws for dogs and cats. Um, I'm not so sure about what's happening in Canada regarding that use, but I know that I have practitioner friends who are, have a list of products that they can, or, or strains that they can send their, their clients to the dispensary to get as quote unquote CBD products that could be used in their pets. So, um, you know, it's opening up here in the U S it's opening up in Canada as a, as a treatment potentially. Um, one one question, Joe. Okay, so I'm I'm familiar with CBD. Uh, you also mentioned CBCs. How do those differ from CBDs? Yeah, I mean it's just the uh, you know if you think about the uh, THC or CBD as sort of a three loop or three ring compound. If you kind of take away one of those uh, tails of the ring, you have a two ring compound, and it's just you know stoichiometrically a different compound. And so if we talk about their potential use, there's actually not a lot on CBC. And I, I would gather the reason we don't have a lot of information on CBC and its, its ability to help with mitigation of pain and, and have neurologic effects is, is in, in at least higher you know, organisms like humans and dogs and cats is the fact that uh, it's you know, hard to make a strain that has all CBC You'll have a strain of plant that'll have some CBC or higher amounts, but it'll still have CBD or THC, which comes into the idea that maybe the admixture can have a slightly different effect. And so, you know, CBC has been known to have anti-inflammatory effects um, and some some potential effects for um, you know, neuropathic pain, et cetera. Um, some people are saying it may be in some of the other derivatives like CBN are, are good for sleep. There's not a lot of great evidence from a clinical perspective right now evidence is really focusing on THC and CBD because they're the two major cannabinoids that can be made from hemp growth or marijuana growth. Um, there's a lot of interest in THC because of the legality, whether it's going to affect sleep, driving, et cetera, pain. And so, I mean, of course, we have FDA-approved drugs that have THC, but there's nothing uh, other than one product that's a CBD product that's an FDA-approved one here in the U.S. called Epidiolex, which is being used for seizures. Interesting. Okay. So as companies start thinking about this, and I certainly um, thank you for giving an outstanding talk at VMX. And, and, and um, first of all, that was the basis for why I wanted to talk to you today. But it also made me realize that I can just turn all requests for CBD over to you very quickly. Because um, the hemp industry is interested uh, in Canada as well for for funding that, so um, my apologies if you're if you're getting those uh, those emails to you. But if you if if the pet food industry is considering um, whether that's food or treats um, for dogs or cats, are they largely looking at targeting pain? Yeah, I mean, I think that's where we're. You know, right now, from a, a clinical evidence point of view, uh, what is CBD or CBDA being used for, right? So, you know, that, that major cannabinoid that can be made in the hemp plant. Right now, there's, uh, there's, there's a few different areas where we think there could be some, some application. Uh, pain, neuropathic chronic pain seems to be an area. Uh, where we may be able to have some effects, which a lot of people think are through a couple different receptor systems like the uh, TRIP-V1 through 4, which are these sensitization, of course, receptors to pain, heat, etc. Um, and then they also think that it has a serotonin, a wellness type of an effect too. And so uh, CBD in general or CBDA, CBD, those guys are, are, are pretty, well, let's just say we have as much evidence as we do of some of our other pain relievers that are pharmaceuticals 
that it can be used to, to mitigate pain. Four out of five studies now have pretty well said that there it seems to be a place for it, right? Um, and we're starting to understand that dosing too, that, that dogs uh, probably need somewhere between one to five milligrams per kilogram body weight of that CBD or CBDA cannabinoid. So it's interesting that we are starting to develop enough evidence that I think most practitioners are saying, yeah, pain's probably a good area. Um, seizures, of course, is another a very interesting area. That's where it's approved as a FDA approved product for uh, seizure control in children. And they're now branching out into, ep- you know, you know, we'll just say common epileptic patients too, and seeing some clinical improvements in, in those folks. Now, it's not a panacea. It's only about 40% seem to respond with a 50% reduction in seizures to it, but it's definitely being put into, we'll say, the, the regimen of, of a lot of seizure patients who have uncontrolled seizures. So we have a couple of studies now, three that are showing positive effects in dogs, right? So it's something to add on when you can't control the seizure, when you're using the common things like zanesamide or something like that. So we have two indications. And then there's actually a third indication. You know, we have a couple of interesting papers that have come out showing that actually ha- controls itch. So a lot of these older, or well, we'll just say atopic dogs who have chronic itching and scratching, little redness under the arms and in the groin, um, constantly chewing on themselves. Uh, it's actually been shown that it can help mitigate that pruritic response, which yeah, we think is partly anti-inflammatory, but also a neurologic response. So if we can dampen the feeling and sensation of itch, then we have less secondary infections due to dogs constantly chewing on their, you know, their, uh, their bellies and their, their arms and legs and stuff. So. Yeah. And a, and a very, a very common complaint by um, geriatric dog owners, right. Is, is oh, yeah. skin conditions. Mm-hmm. So, while I also love dogs, I, I noticed here that you didn't comment on its application uh, to cats. Um, yeah, we're, we're getting there. Um, somebody will have a, a, a study out sooner or later. I mean, I think now that the, the evidence is starting to mount in, in the dog world, uh, the cat world is like the next thing. I'm sure in the next two to three years, we're going to start seeing more and more cat studies come out. Um, you know, anecdotally, there's, there's also the, well, the one area we didn't really hit on is anxiety, right? Um, you know, so uh, because it does have the sort of dampening of the neurologic response, there's, there's some thought that CBD, CBDA type products could be used for, for sort of the separation anxieties, the car ride phobias, the going to the vet phobias. And anecdotally, when you talk to people, that's why most people actually use it is for anxiety in their dogs. Um, yet we just don't have a lot of, we'll just say real world evidence. We have a lot of interesting models that are used, which are get some beagles, take them on a car ride, see if they respond. That's not normal because most of those beagles are not really anxiety ridden. So you get a kind of hit and miss response. Uh, same thing, you know, you put a dog in a room and see if they pace around a lot. Well, some dogs just lay down. We just finished a study at Texas Tech where it was like, okay, all these shelter dogs came in for you know, students to look at and a, weekly basis and then we're like got to get video of them in their kennel to see if they've got stereotypic behaviors and circling and it's like now they all just went to sleep because guess what they like being alone and they enjoyed sleeping when they got to their kennel that's not a stressed dog so we have to we have to find a, a really good clinical population to do those kinds of studies in and there's a little bit of evidence through some of these we'll just say models that, that we can dampen it with acute use slightly higher doses than even what i was recommending before so Interesting. Um, so do dogs and cats, and when we think about, because I, I know that one issue uh, here in Canada when um, marijuana was legalized is um, a veterinarian saw an uptick in accidental consumption of THC edibles um, uh, by pets. And, uh, it, it, uh, at least anecdotally and, uh, what I've been told is that they have, they have a much more profound effect at much lower doses. So is, is, is there any accuracy to that? You've mentioned doses of CBD and I know I'm delineating now and, and really probably asking you about THC as well, and maybe for our Canadian listeners, this is this is important if they're they're not looking for a pet food that's doing a well controlled job, 
but they're buying edibles for their own use and thinking about giving them to their dog uh, or cat for that matter. What is your caution? What are the differences between humans and dogs and cats? Yeah, I think that's kind of the interesting part is that, of course, most people are, you know, doing inhalable, right? Vaping and, and using, you know, flour and whatnot. Um, the edible market is, of course, growing. And I've, I've seen some numbers from Canada where it's, it's you know, still less than like 20% of the use is, is edibles. But I always think there's that risk, right, is that you get the gummies. And they're actually trying to do regulation in Canada, unlike here, where it's like you can only put up to 10 milligrams in a gummy. You can't put more than there, five or 10 or something like that. Um, so that we can actually stop kids from eating them and dogs from eating them as because they think it's uh, a candy, right? Um, and I think that, interestingly, everybody says, oh, the, uh, there's a lot of conjecture. Oh, dogs are sensitive. Dogs are actually quite sensitive from, from uh, ataxia. They'll get a little wonky and a little bit stumbly. But when we talk about large dose consumption, dogs are actually more resistant than most other animals because in rats, you can actually give enough THC to cause seizures. When they've done that with dogs, they could not induce seizures. They, they've given dogs 25 milligrams per day per kig body weight and shown that dogs can tolerate it quite well for, I think it was up to a year. And they were Whoa. actually, so this, this was all part of the big, you know, uh, approval of Sativex in the U.S. They had to show chronic consumption didn't uh, really affect you know, people at high doses. And so, of course, they use dogs and rats. And, and the dogs were actually quite, 25 mg per kg is, is a lot. Yeah. Uh, and they, they went about their day and they got very tolerant to it after about a week. And so, I think there's this misnomer that everybody's like, oh, dogs are so sensitive. No, dogs aren't that sensitive. What is actually what we're finding to be quite interesting is that when we look at absorption, comparing humans and dogs is that a lot of people are like, well, it doesn't, you know, CBD doesn't really work in humans that well. You need really high doses. And if you actually look at dogs and cats and their absorption, they're about fivefold better at absorbing CBD and THC. Okay. And so sure. if you're going to look at a species that's going to benefit from it, dogs and cats are, I'd like to say, God's favorite creatures as far as CBD is concerned because they absorb more of it than humans and horses and, and a lot of omnivores or herbivores. Uh, so just out of, out of my own curiosity, uh, mechanistically, um, why might that be? How how are how is CBD transported? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we understand exactly how it's transported. We think it's pretty lipophilic and it goes over with fats because it's been shown that if you eat a fatty meal, you absorb two to threefold more as a human. They've shown that in dogs as well. And so we know it's absorbed sort of with the fat absorption. But we also know that the the ability for the liver to kind of chew it up and, and you know get rid of it through the cytochrome P450 system is different in dogs and cats than it is in people. They don't even use it with the same cytochromes to, to actually hydroxylate and, and you know, carboxylate and then eliminate. So there's definitely differences in metabolism. And so you know we've done comparative studies with the, um, the company that I've been working with, looking at humans, horses, dogs, cats, parrots, right? And so if you kind of compare the, the horse, the horse is an, a complete herbivore. They're used to eating all kinds of fun weeds and they need to get rid of some of these compounds. We're, we're omnivores and so we get rid of them pretty good because we like to eat lots of roots and plants too. At least this is my conjecture. And then we've got the carnivorous species that don't eat a lot of plant material. Therefore, their cytochromes are set up to detoxify different things. And so... At least that's my point of view is that the dogs and cats, we can get, uh, you know, 100, 200, 300 nanograms in the bloodstream and a human who is getting the same dose, they get 10, 15, right? So literally a, a, a five-fold difference or a ten-fold difference in the, in the actual neutral cannabinoids. But what's been pretty well shown now is I talked a little bit about the acids like THCA and, and CBDA and CBCA that the raw, the raw form for the plant. Those, regardless of species, are always higher than the neutrals. So, you know, you can absorb those acids a lot better and they probably have very similar pharmacologic activity. And so, um, you know, the acids are kind of an interesting area that have been understudied. If you look at some of the, the rodent models that have been looked at, not so much the, the human stuff or the dog and cat stuff. We've done some work in dog and cat, but 
Uh, the acids actually have anti-nausea capability. They have anti-serotonergic or sorry, pro-serotonergic activity. Um, they actually can, can dampen the inflammatory response through the PPAR alpha, uh, PPAR gamma system. So there's, as we say, the cannabinoid, it, everybody's like, oh, well, this study looked like it worked. This study didn't look like it worked. Completely different products, right? And so, you know, every product is not going to be exactly the same. And that's where I think the foundational research really needs to be done, right? What does CBD do? What does CBDA do? What does CBC do? And that's where, yeah, no, nobody's going to really fund that stuff outside of industry. It really would be nice to see the, you know, the USDA and some of the agricultural communities kind of get to get together and say, listen, this is getting used a lot out there in our dogs and cats. It's not the species that we're that interested in, but we should be setting aside some funding for those kinds of interesting studies so that we understand the safety. Um, we understand uh, the potential you know, pharmacology of it. And that's where it's, it's kind of hard to get that kind of funding in dogs and, dogs and cats. If I wanted to do cows and chickens, great. There's plenty of funding for that. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, Not that we got the funding, but a few years back, I, I joined with some um, other agriculture animal nutritionists to look at hemp. And I was the only one that wasn't looking. At, everybody had to look at THC in, in the meat products or the milk products or the egg products um, because that was Health Canada's major concern um, at the time if you start using that. But, but to your point about using the dog and the cat, I, I, I think too – that um, it acts as a bridge. And a lot of what you've already mentioned here, um, if you can mitigate pain or you can mitigate inflammation or you can mitigate inflammatory or neural driven uh, behaviors that the owner doesn't like, like itching, these presumably will improve the quality of life of the animal. And I think that we're all invested across the board, whether that's humans, pets, or animals, in providing new tools to improve quality of life. And and indeed, you know, you mentioned um, sleep. And I, I am, you know, there's it's not, we all know as humans having a poor night's sleep can derail a whole week of work. Um, I, 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 sleeping is so important, but we don't think about how our pets are sleeping or where we're, where we're putting them or how we're supporting them. So um, I really hope that, that you'll get some, some support here to look at these and, and quality of life in, in particular, whether that's pain or not. So on, on that note, when you're looking at consumer noticeable outcomes, um, owner noticeable outcomes, how, I mean, you and I can do all kinds of biomarkers and mechanisms of action, da, 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 that we got that part. What, how do you look at consumer noticeable outcomes when it comes to the efficacy of, um, of hemp products that contain CBD? Yeah, I think that's what's made it. I, I'll just say it's, yeah, I, I like you, I'm kind of a science nerd, right? I, I want to I know about pharmacokinetics. I want to know about absorption, elimination. I want to look at a biomarker for inflammation, right? And, you know, that's, that's all well and good. But at the end of the day, it is about what is the owner perceiving, right? And of course, that's why doing placebo blinded are extremely important studies because, oh, yeah, you give an owner a sugar pill, 30% of them are going to tell you their dog looks better, doesn't it, sure, is, everything's better. And so I think that's the important part is that we do these placebo-blinded type of things. And, and you know, if you look at, at how certain things get approved by the FDA, there are, there are surveys that you are validated surveys that you give owners, the canine brief pain inventory, uh, liver pool osteoarthritis index. Um, uh, you've got um, uh, the, the VAS scoring system. VAS scoring system is, you know, been a a validated scoring system for itch for owners to do um, Cadeci, which is a, a, a validated uh, scoring system to look at, you know, lesion resolution uh, for atopic dogs. So I think trying to use those, those metrics are the best we have. I'm not going to say they're perfect, um, but they are the best thing that we have. And that's even what the FDA looks at and approving, you know, drugs. So I think they're, they're, just say that the best thing we have, a lot of people like to look at, you know, force plate kinetics and things of that nature. 
the forest plate kinetics have a, a raft of issues with the speed of the dog, the comfortableness of the dog. There's, there's been shown variations at time of the day that you run dogs across these plates as to you know how much uh, asymmetry they have in front and, and back limbs. So, you know, there's there's a lot of tools, but a lot of those tools take time. And let's face it, at the end of the day, is that the owner is is what they're where they're perceiving. That's why they're going to buy that product again or go back to that dispensary is because, hey, my dog isn't itching nearly half as much. So I like what I see, or my dog is actually playing and bringing toys to me again. And he wasn't doing that before. That's the positive outcome. And that's the funny thing is that we talk about anxiety. That's why a lot of people use it and they're like, yep, it works. I don't have data to just say it works, but that's what they say. And when, and when you give, you know, give a hundred people and 85 of them come back and say, yeah, that really helped my dog or 80, that's probably more than placebo effect. Right. So, and there's inner dog variation. There's so many things from a behaviors. Like I would hate to be a behaviorist. It is such a hard job because every dog is different in terms of the way they're reacting. And every owner is different into how, how annoying they perceive that activity to be. And so that's, that's the, really the difficult part. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I I work with some some mythologists and behaviorists, and and it is. I continue to learn. It is. It it seems like it's going to be simple from the outside, but it is extraordinarily complex. Um. So uh. So yeah, we have to um. We have to continue to support their work too. Okay, so when companies are thinking about then making a product that would contain CBD, so I think we're we're for pet products. I think um, you've you've pushed us a little bit more towards CBD. What stands in their way for regulation? So if there's a pet food company that's putting up their hand right now saying. I want to make a hemp based product that hits a CBD amount. What regulations are standing in their way? What work do they need to do before they launch that product? Yeah, and that's the that's the big problem is that the at least the regulation here is is so I'll just say slightly obtuse in terms of what you can and can't say. I mean, there's an old dietary supplement uh, act from the 80s that everybody still kind of follows which basically says you can pretty much put any kind of a CBD product out there and say it's a, you know, a cannabinoid product, but you can't say it helps a certain disease. You can say it's good for musculoskeletal health. I don't, don't know what that means. It's good for immune health. It's good for neurologic support, right? So it's the problem is that, you know, you get, you get the bottle and it says, oh, a cannabinoid, and it doesn't tell you an indication. It just sort of says you should give one of these per 10 pounds body weight because can't say that you're using a drug in there and you know you're using a whole hemp product it's got a gamish of things yes cbd is the major component but it has all these other things so you're going to be giving you know so much cannabinoid you know per per soft gel or per mill of oil and then that gets into the whole idea that you know doesn't sound very legitimate right but you know if we have literature to support it you know, that our American Association of Veterinary State Boards has now basically said, listen, we're not so sure everybody should be using it. The, the information is new. We don't have a lot of large randomized controlled placebo trials, but who does in veterinary medicine? It's just very hard to get those kinds of things done. And so they sort of put out guidelines that you know, there should be good quality control. You should see the QC and make sure that the label matches um, what's in that product that you're giving. You should look for contamination with pesticides, heavy metals, et cetera, to make sure it's a pure product. And most good companies aren't going to release a product that has that stuff in it. And then, you know, you should also look at ones that have done safety work. So do they have a three, six month years to safety study at the dose that's recommended? Um, so companies like that are the ones that they, you know, BBS has said, yeah, you, you know, if you're going to use it, use those types of products from those kinds of companies. So that takes you from 100 products on the shelf down to like two or three that could potentially be used, right? Um, and then it's about, you know, I think that's the, you and I both know pet food's a whole different story. Can you put it into pet food? Well, no, you shouldn't put it into pet food because it's not been an approved ingredient in pet food. Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, California pretty much made their own rules for production and and putting 
cannabinoids into pet food and said, yep, you can do it. And if the pet food is made in California and sold in California, it can be done. And so the American Association of Food Control Officials, or Feed Control Officials pretty much said, hey, what the hell are you guys doing? You're going against the entire industry mantra. So there's been a lot of back and forth about whether that's actually legitimate. And I haven't really kept up because AFCO's got all of, a lot of rules. And, and that's that's part of making a pet food is, is making sure you can get through every state's, um, I'll just say, a regulatory body to say that, yes, you can sell with pet food in this state. So it's a really arduous process for a pet food company. As you well know, I, I wouldn't want to be a feed regulatory official at, at a pet food company because you, you, know, you have to comply with every state's rules, regulations, and their official who doesn't like the way you worded something. And you got to go change your label on the bag because somebody from Kentucky said they didn't like the your use of so, you know, the algae, the, the term that you use for the algae you put in, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 my sense is that there's a lot of gatekeeping and not a lot of uh, proactive collaboration um, in some of these cases. And it would be nice to see some proactive collaboration. So on that note then, Joe, um, hemp in and of itself as a as an ingredient is also not approved. And it, it, it could it has other purposes in a pet food other than delivery of C B D, correct? Yeah, I, I mean I think that interesting part is that, that we have a pretty interesting, you know, feed source here, hemp seed, right? And and <laughs> You know, it comes from the hemp plant. What do you do with the rest of the plant? Well, hey, great. You make CBD supplements or, or whatever you want to do. But that hemp plant has an extremely rich protein and fat source that's got a great fatty acid profile. And it's interesting because I would have thought five years ago, as soon as in 2018 when the farm bill passed, I figured I'd see 100 papers out there about how they were using hemp seed or hemp seed cake uh, in, in dog and cat foods nobody's doing it. And part of that is because AFCO, I think, has pretty much put the brakes on hemp seed cake as a feed ingredient. I know that they've been putting the dossier to AFCO a couple of times now, but it's never been approved of using hemp seed or hemp seed cake. And part of that issue is that some of these hemp seed uh, cakes or even just the hemp seeds are, um, are contaminated with cannabinoids and there's high variability, which creates that issue is like, you know, Maybe, you, know, you, you have to be able to prove that you're, in essence, cannabinoid-free or below some level on your hemp seed or hemp seed cake before we go through. And I think that's where AFCO and some of the other you know, Canadian officials have issues with putting this into pet food is that God knows what you're going to end up with. And if you get a mild intoxication because somebody's got a lot of THC in their hemp seed cake and you're using 20% of it in a pet food, then that's an issue. It's the same exact problem we're having with getting it into eggs and we're getting it into you know, ruminant feeds is because they don't want contamination in milk and eggs and meats and stuff. But we're getting there. It's, it's going to be a slow process. Interesting. Is uh, just out of curiosity, what's what's the, um, I, and I don't know if you would know this, but the sustainability profile of hemp as a crop in contrast to some of our more conventional crops, is it, is it, are, are crop farmers interested in planting hemp because of its potential in in the whole soil health system? Yeah, well, I mean, hemp is a pretty interesting plant in and of itself because it's been used to bioremediate soils, right? So if you had a you know, old mining industry that have things like cadmium, nickel, lead, they actually plant hemp around there to actually mitigate the soil of the, some of the, the heavy metals. Um, it's actually quite good at that. And so it's actually been used for that from an agricultural perspective, but now you've got a product that may, may be high in lead. So it comes with a bit of a catch-22 to some degree as well. Um, and then, you know, I think, I think where the, the, the real agricultural or, or pet food use is, is a, of course, a lot of people like hemp seed oil. It's a, it's a really good omega-6, omega-3 oil. It's got alpha-linolenic. It's got gamma-linolenic. It's got a lot of interesting fatty acid profiles to it, which are considered healthful in the human world. That's why you can find hemp seed oil everywhere. Um, but what do you do with all that, you know, that refuse? Yes, the the stalk and leaf can be used to make ropes and fabrics and things like that. But I've got all this hemp seed, we'll call it cake, very protein rich, mild fatty acid rich um, product that could be used in the feed industry. 
if you have it and it's cheap because it's considered refuse, why not use it? And I think that's where you know the, a lot of the push is. I think somebody said there was a conference just in Colorado, which was all about the agricultural use pretty much. And I think we're heading down that direction, which is like if we have a lot of hemp being grown, we have to figure out what to do. And of course, that becomes a sustainable thing. I mean, if we can have a decent protein source and we don't have to use as much fish in our product, we don't have to use as much meat, beef, it's going to be far better for the environment than uh, you know, using red meats and fish. So I think there's a place for it. It's just uh, got to get on your, everybody's got to get on the drum and bash the drum a little bit to, to move it forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, everything is usually slow moving something like this this forward, um, indeed. Um, so this does, though. I, I think that heavy metal testing is 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 fairly common. However, if a, a company wanted to start to invest and look at hemp products and doing some research um, to support their possible innovation. Uh, is there any, can companies go to analytical contract, analytical facilities? Is it only, only Cornell? Are you running this stuff in house? Uh, how do you, how do you get these analyticals done? No, we, I mean, I think uh, from our perspective, you know, we've had plenty of discussions with uh, a good friend of ours, Jack Henyon, who used to run Advion Labs. And he's like, you must go to a 17025 certified laboratory that actually has hemp as one of the things that they're certified in analyzing for you for all these constituents, right? Pesticides, uh, heavy metals. And it's a big undertaking for labs, but there's actually a dozen or so labs in the U.S. that are actually will test your materials. And so recently I had a friend in, in, down in Florida who sent the same materials to three different labs to get an analysis, right? And on the most part, everybody was within 10% of each other in terms of the analysis. So we're, we're probably in a much better spot. Nowadays, if you're going hemp, um, you know, there's new laws in the U.S., which is you have to send it to a specific facility uh, for the analysis of your hemp before it can, in essence, be marketed. So, um, you know, there's <clears throat> there are checks and measures slowly being put in place to ensure uh, we'll just say legitimacy of the testing, ensuring that everybody's getting things tested at you know similar facilities. So, you know, heading in the right direction. But you know, we, it's, you know, not too hard to do. You can do on feed material HPLC and, and get pretty darn good results. A lot of people use GCMS um, at the larger facilities to get you know, full terpene um, profiles as well, and some of the minor cannabinoids. So, I think it's uh, it's very doable. And uh, it's not that expensive, you know, to, to get your samples tested. I mean, you know, 75, 80 bucks for a whole cannabinoid profile. It's not that expensive. So. Wow. That, that's, that's cheaper than getting your TDFs done on that same hemp product. So that's, uh, that's good news for, for companies that want to invest in innovation. So, <clears throat> indeed, kind of overall, absolutely hearing that there's, there's a lot of opportunity, but there's a lot of hurdles to development of products. And so for any of our listeners that are interested in innovating this, I think uh, that you're probably a very good place to, to start the discussion uh, for them. And uh, it's definitely an opportunity for a new product with a new consumer deliverable. So I thought maybe uh, a, a good way of kind of really maybe sharing with the listeners what they might be able to see is I was wondering if you had a story about using THC or CBD uh, with a clinical case that you could share. Um, you know, we, we did one of the original studies um, back in 2017, 18, when the farm bill did pass. Um, and uh, when we did that study, and, and still to this day that I get people who come up and they're like, Hey, I hear that the CBD might work. And I'm always like, Oh, I got a half dozen pills left over from this study. Give it a try. If you like it, then go, go order it. And two thirds of the time people are like, yeah, I really liked it. Where do I order this stuff? So I think there's definitely a place for it. And my favorite story is we started the study and uh, it was a placebo blinded study. And I handed out the bottles on a Friday uh, to one of our technicians here. Um, and uh, Monday morning, she came in, just ran into my office and said, I don't know what you get my dog, but 
she's completely different. She's, she came upstairs for the first time. She brought me a toy. She hasn't done that in, in two years. And she had, you know, systemic, just, we'll just say arthritis just about everywhere in her body. Um, and I think all those geriatric dogs do real well. And she started crying. I just, I've never seen anybody cry in my office and tell me what a great thing I did for their animal when I gave a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory or, or, or gabapentin for pain. So I was like, wow, that's interesting. And then I'm like, oh, that's a one-off, you know. And then um, an orthopedist in our hospital said, oh, my mom's dog's in pretty bad shape. Yeah, I'd love to get him in the trial. Same thing happened. She comes in and I'm like, uh, five days after I started, she goes, I don't know what you gave Nick, but Nick is just like running around like a puppy. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. I don't, what the heck is that stuff? And I said, I don't know. I hope he's not on placebo. <laughs> Cause, right? Yeah. Right? And then, you know, at the end, the analysis was pretty dramatic in terms of like some of these really old dogs who just, you think they're kind of at the end, right? You know, just he's got bad arthritis. He's on two or three meds, put it on top and got some really nice responses. And so I was, I was pretty impressed. This was, this was not the typical response you get in a clinical study for, for you know, most, most things that you try in the clinic. So. And fast. Yeah, right. Five days later, four days later. And, and did it, did it continue for, I mean, I understand we're talking about old dogs and they live a fraction of the lifespan that we have. So even if you, you can get a couple of months of a better quality of life, uh, this is, this is what everybody wants, um, for their, their close bond with that animal. So was it, was it prolonged as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that was a four-week study, so we saw it in four weeks. And then I've, I've had you know, multiple friends who are practitioners who say, yeah, I was, I was going to euthanize this Great Dane. And, you know, it's you know, one of our text dogs. She was really upset. I said, here, take a bag of these home. We'll see how he's doing Monday. And, you know, she's, she kept going for seven months before he had to euthanize just by trying one new thing, right? So, you know. Yeah, seven months is is like a, that's the equivalent of having a decade uh, with a grandparent almost, right? So that that's really impactful. Uh, thanks for sharing those stories, Joe. Really, really nice. It's time for our famous three. So um, we are nearing the end. I, as I said earlier, I can't wait to have you back to talk about working dogs. We're going to have a hilarious conversation about working dogs and, and mushers. We can't, we can't talk about um, at least sled dogs without talking about those interesting raft of people. No um, <laughs> really, really fun. Um, but I always like to ask uh, a couple of questions um, kind of a little bit more broadly at the end. Um, so one of them is that if a company is interested um, so I've already said that they can reach out to you, but if they're interested in first reading a bit more about the potential of cannabinoids in either treats or foods and, and how that kind of moves the bar, do you have any recommendations? Yeah, I'll be honest with you. you just go to your PubMed search engine and type in my last name because I'm on a good half of the veterinary papers. And then there's another person named Steph McGrath out of Colorado State. You type McGrath in their walk slog, you'll get at least 80% or at least 75% of the veterinary literature on, on cannabinoids at this point. Fantastic. Have have the two of you um, thought about putting uh, your brands together and doing a little uh, uh, where we are now and where we have to go paper? Uh, it's actually in Javma <laughs> right now. It's Excellent. Summer. So we wrote an efficacy paper together and she hit the neuro stuff. I hit the pain stuff and the Excellent. Is that out already? Yep. It's uh, yeah, it's in Javma. I think it was out in probably last uh, April, April or May of 2023. So. Okay. Really, really good uh, starting point. And uh, maybe as it pertains to its application in clinical medicine, um, is there anything that you now where CBD supplements are your go-to for dogs in their treatment? Um, I will just say the go-to, I'm going to say that the old dog who comes in and the owner's like, he just isn't himself. And, um, that quote unquote pain, that quality of life is where I see it. It's most impactful. And so sometimes before we even 
Yeah, let's see. We tried non-steroidals a couple of years ago. It didn't really work. It's just gone downhill. I'm like, just try this. And 60, 70% are like, yep, where's my second bag? So, yeah, you know, what was the second bottle? And you do also have a paper out on where you review different products and whether they met met their um, packaging, right? So if 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 owners, if or, so, uh, uh, regardless of whether these people are thinking about innovating a pet product, if you're actually interested in using them, you also have the information in the literature in terms of uh, which product hits backs and and um, why not, right? Great. Yeah, and I, I think from our perspective, it was a, you know, listen, we, we didn't name all the products out there. Most of them were under their 0.3% THC. Uh, only one really had some pretty significant heavy metal contamination. Um, and that a lot of products are just so low. If you just go for 30 or 40 migs per mil or, or you, know, you know, migs per gram of the chew, that's where you want to hit because Dogs do need, let's say an average Labrador needs somewhere around 60 milligrams at least once, if not twice a day. And so it's like if you get a tincture that's got 10 milligrams in it, right, per mil, you got to give six mils and it's a 60 mil bottle in five days you're out, right? And you just spend you know, $49.99 on that. So that price comparison is kind of an important aspect too. So I think you just talk to your veterinarians. Veterinarians are starting to learn more and they know more than, than they ever have. And then there's a, a veterinary um, hemp society where there's actually cannabinoid practitioners that have got some additional training. So you could actually go onto their website and contact and just say, listen, I'm interested and I you know, want to consult. And the veterinary hemp society has practitioners that'll help you. Oh, interesting. Really, really great advice. Okay. And last but not least... If you were to put a kennel of dogs together, A, what what breed would they be? And B, what races will you sign up for? Because this is what you're going to do when you retire, right? Oh, yeah, right. Well, I would I would definitely get German short hair crosses, and I would definitely still do sprint. I mean, 10-mile sprints, that's, my, that's where I'm at. That's what I would do. Nice. Well, I'm going to hold you to that. Um, in fact, when you retire, I'm just going to keep asking when when you're competing so I can come and watch um, because uh, because I, I know you it's so much I fun. Know you, I know you, Chef. You, you, you will want to just come and do research on my dogs. <laughs> oh, that's that's possible. But I think I'll probably want you to teach me more about the sport. Um uh, as well, I, I I do really like sports uh, yeah. as well. So uh, I hope to see you out there. So Joe, thank you. It is always a tremendous pleasure to get to talk to you. You're just so fascinating in terms of the research and the practice that that you run, and it's always a, a just just a pleasure. Thank you very much. Always great talking to you. You take care. <laughs>